Hi, I'm Emily Levine. Uh, terribly sorry to announce that I'm replacing Danny Hillis, who has a sinus condition that didn't allow him to fly today. And uh, the only time I've ever had a more intimidating circumstance was replacing Gore Vidal at the last moment, so that worked out. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, I'm actually really nervous because I looked at your bio about 20 minutes before I came up here and you're a comedian. I'm yes, really, I am. I'm scared of comedians. Well, you know, I, I have to say you were on the Colbert show and I looked at that and you were wearing the same socks. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't, haven't washed them either. I'm trying to save energy. I couldn't decide whether you had 100 pairs of the same socks or just never washed them. My, my wife will love you. So she actually <laughs> bought me not 100, but 10 pairs of these socks. Well, I like them. That's why I noticed them. Thank but you. And she I'm loves sure everyone is fascinated by this uh, Danny Hillis type conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, you know, speaking to Stephen Colbert oh. was, was fascinating. I was like, don't try and be funnier than a comedian because they'll kick your ass. But the truth is you... Now, I'm going to say something personal, and uh -oh. I'm, please don't, I, I don't mean, uh, this is, oh, I also watched your TED Talk, okay. and it seemed to me, because I'm a performer and I look at things like breathing and voice quality and stuff, it looked to me as if you were more nervous on your TED Talk, and then completely not nervous on Colbert. Uh, you, you age and you get wisdom. Aha. Uh -huh. I suspect. And you just surrender. But TED is a very strange format, and then they, they actually, they're, they're even more fascist with the bell and the buzzer than, you know, than, than I, they are here. I did it three times, but I did it before the whole focus switched over to TED Talks, where you really had to right. be on time, you had to be rehearsed, and you had to wear makeup. Uh, so anyway, um, Danny did want me to express his admiration for you. And as he as I, I will express my admiration for Danny. Okay, you. this is what I love, just being the middle person here. Um, but um, also, he did want me to ask you about uh, why you don't think fusion will cure everything, but you've already sort of said it won't, and I, let's not go into it, because honestly, it's, I'm more interested... It, it's a short <laughs> conversation. Fusion, fusion can solve a lot of stuff, and I hope we make it work. I, you know, we, uh, I, I would ask everyone in the audience to lobby the world's governments to increase funding for fusion, not decrease it, which is the trend. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, I do have, uh, I want to know more about how tunes, but I first, before I forget, uh, see, I love science, but I also critique it. And uh, one of my uh, issues with science is uh, how it filters down into society. For instance, right. the idea that, uh, as you stated, Galileo introduced this idea that we should be able to measure everything and make everything measurable. Yeah, to me, in society adopting this idea, it's not always so good. For one thing, it turns out to put value on things you can count, or in fact, that's what it means to make something count is uh, if you can count it. And then we have uh, this whole thing with polls, which you know is a way of counting that in my mind isn't even scientific. Right, so we don't disagree on polls not being true. Oh, good. So have you noticed this? This is the thing that makes me think they're not scientific. I, I have noticed in the same way I notice your socks, because I always notice the odd detail, that in almost every poll I read, only 2% don't know. It doesn't matter what the question is, just 2% don't, even in things where you would think it would be impossible not to know. Like I read a poll that asked of men, have you ever had sex with a woman you seriously disliked? Is that to me, that question? <laughs> oh, <laughs> have you? Well, it's interesting because, I mean, just what would your guess be on the percentage that said yes? Uh, so, to, to avoid this question, <laughs> I, I have heard the statistic that you can query the American population on any singular question, no, and no matter how ridiculous the question may be, and 20% will answer positive. So, you know, have you, you know, do you believe in alien abduction? 20%? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
and questions right. of this right. So I, what, what men, I want to know about the polls. Also men, if you say, have you, you know, they don't even listen to the rest of the question. Have you ever had sex? Yes. It doesn't, you know. <laughs> but what was interesting to me was, you know, it turns out that 55% said yes, which was encouraging. I thought that's just slightly less than two thirds. Uh, no, 58% said yes, 40%, 2% not, no, didn't know. 2% didn't know whether they'd had sex with a woman they seriously disliked. <laughs> so polls to me, and I'm happy to hear to you, are something suspect. It, it, yeah, it, it is. I think we're, we're learning to deal with statistics better. Um, but it, these, these polls don't seem like they're terrible. The, you know, the, the, the problem, the unscientific part of the poll to me is the way you answer the question and the way you phrase it. And there's too much semantics in the question oh. to, to, to give you a really great scientific answer. Absolutely. I once um, Because I'm sure some of those men were like, I had sex with a woman that, that um, it, it was the sex bad or was the woman bad, right? So there would have been a certain number who were just like, did I dislike the sex that I had with this woman? Rather than that I did dislike You the think woman. they gave it that much thought? <laughs> I, I think they gave it not enough thought to make sure they understood the question. Or what about this one? This one killed me. This was asked of married Jewish women, is your husband Jewish? 2% didn't know. I mean, that's why I always leave a light on. But, um, so, uh, but you're, I actually... Is, is the 20 minutes up? <laughs> Oh my gosh! No, no, this is great. This is, I, you know, this is why I fear comedians. I, it's 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 wonderful, but um, yeah. You feel I've hijacked. No, no, hit me again. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so uh, tell me about how tunes, because I'm I, this. I think is fantastic. Okay, so I I, uh, I I work with a wonderful illustrator called Nick Dragotta who. In his, his day job is drawing comics for DC and Marvel, superheroes and women with cat's tails and double D breasts and that type of stuff. That's contempor That's where comics ended up. Right. Um, but we are very interested in how do you illustrate in an adventurous way uh, science and engineering for sort of eight to 10 year olds. And so we sort of think up ridiculous adventure stories and he illustrates those adventure stories and hopefully they motivate kids to not have a fear of the physical world. Like, in some respects, we're just trying to encourage that you can tinker with the world, you can break your toys, the world is understandable, don't have any fear of it, just play with it and experiment with it. Oh, I love that. I, that's so much better than making science accessible to children. Yeah, no, that's not good. I think there's, we've, we've Science education is in a horrible place. I know. I'm making a movie that is, because I think, as I have, I'm sure, indicated by now, that my interest in science is because I think the big ideas from science filter down to society and then are appropriated for good or for ill. So my question to you, do you think science is winning or losing? And what I mean, do you think, when, what I mean specifically is, uh, do you think rational thought and... Ah is winning or losing. I'm actually, I'm, right, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm trying to find th desperately things to cling to that are positive about the future, and I actually think that science is winning. You know, I feel hoist with my own petard because I have been um, critiquing rationalism, not rationality, but rationalism for a while, and now that the United States is having this, what I call the revolt against reason, which is basically what's going on. I mean, people who two, just two are, don't Americans. bother us with facts. We don't want to, you know, let us just make up whatever we want and let us just go solely on the power of our emotional response to things. And the country, and these people, what bothers me is their inability to understand when they're even contradicting themselves. And I'm looking for an example of that I found that was so amazing, which was, uh, personal ad in an Israeli newspaper, and uh, it said, whoops, oh, here it is. It said, I am a sensitive Jewish man whom you can open your heart to, share your innermost thoughts and deepest secrets, confide in me, I'll understand your insecurities, no fatties, please. <laughs> And 
But, you know, you listen to tea partiers, whatever, and the contradictions are just phenomenal. And, and the other thing that goes along with this to me, and this, you know, I'm curious about whether or not science played a role at all in this, because, you know, Danny and I have talked about this, because I critique uh, rational choice, that discipline of economics that uses mathematical models to predict the way rational agents will behave, and anything that doesn't fit the model sort of gets thrown out, like the way people actually behave. And right, so you're confusing, again, economics with science. Well, but, but when I brought this up with Danny, Danny said, but, you know, science uses mathematical models because they are good metaphors. Danny understands that they're not actual reality. But I think the distinction between what I, th there's something I now call correspondence reality, where it's kind of like reality, but not really like reality, and then it comes, you know, back up to hit you in the face, like I read in the National Enquirer a story about an Australian lion tamer who'd been mauled by his lion. And the, science, the sentence that I thought was really interesting and troublesome was, uh, Mr. Russell, who learned lion taming through a correspondence course. <laughs> <laughs> but I think a lot of that is going on right now. And of course, in the Bush White House, you know, they, 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 they made fun of fact-based reality. So, so it does worry me. I'm with you on that. I, I completely agree. And so at some larger level, we're, it, it's easy to feel like we're losing. But all of those people, and th this is what gives me hope, is, is that all of those people, when they're making purchasing decisions um, or decisions about their health, you know, so, you know, uh, my wife has a family who are very religious, uh, her cousins and aunties and uncles and, and probably are tea party-ish. I don't know if I should have said this because they're recording it. but Because uh, they're what? Recording it. And, oh. and so, so in, in many ways, these, these are people who you know, don't believe in evolution and, and climate change and these things. And, and, and that's fine. They're actually some of the best, they have some of the best sense of family of anyone I've ever met. And that's really lovely. But at the same time, they have those opinions. You know, they really listen to the latest public health research, so they're making the best decisions about where to get their water from, or is this shampoo going to be more toxic or less toxic than that? And I think this is prevalent in, in you know, actually, we, we, I have an 18-month-old son, and, and my wife, who is not a scientist, looks for the latest science on you know, sources of lead, sources of iron, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time... But this, is, this is science filtering down, and I think people are absor On a daily basis, I think people are touching a lot more of these things. Whether the quality of the science that goes in all these studies is good or not is another question. But I think we are listening with hope that what the way I think science is winning because of this is because we are slowly understanding that it is our best hope at finding the right answer. Well, first of all, these same people are rebelling against health care that would benefit them. So I'm not sure it's always true. And secondly, it makes me nervous to think in terms of winning and losing right. because it sets up what I think of as a false dichotomy, that the more we go with that either or logic, and set things up I'm in a an reductionist. adversarial gonna, form. Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, that's my other issue <laughs> with science. But I think it... <laughs> but see, I'm looking to negotiate the tension between us, not to win or lose. And that's... I wish science would make more of that accommodation. I'd, so I'm really interested in... in it. Obviously, it frustrates you. How, how, do, how do we improve it? Because, I mean, I actually think scientists are responsible for doing an awful job of communicating what they do and their science. And I think it's a very open question. How do we, how do, we do it better? So you sound like the most qualified or at least most angry person I've ever met on this most issue. Angry? <laughs> <Or at least laughs> angry. Most angry at the communication. Really well, I, I, I mean, actually, most people are dispassionate. I mean, I, we can poll the audience. <laughs> who, who, here, who here thinks science communication is good or bad? I'm just asking, how do we improve? The anger. Okay. How many people perceive me as angry? <laughs> Two percent of the audience thinks you're angry. <laughs> Did you count? Did well, you it's measure? One, one, two, and then this is, yeah. So, um, 
Well, I mean, that's interesting. I, I, I don't feel as if I'm angry. I feel as if I honestly care passionately that about. Okay, that's so let me, let me rephrase my question because I introduced a word that was, was hot anger. But so how do we do it better? Because, I mean, it is terrible. Well, honestly, What's for your vision for science my vision, communication? It, oh, well, wow. That's a big question. My vision is that, for instance, it, it upsets me. I listened to Richard Dawkins the other day on NPR, and one of the callers who was, uh, said that he had been brought up Catholic, and he had this idea, and blah, blah, blah. And Richard Dawkins started to give a very good answer, and then he said, but if you'd been brought up in a different religion, you'd have a different set of beliefs, so doesn't that make you feel kind of stupid? And um, that's, it was that, right. why go there? Because uh, we're human. <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't like, uh, you know, a momentary slip that there are, and, and I guess we need them. I mean, my idea is as long as we have so many rabid people and, and true believers on this end of the spectrum, we should have some on that end of the spectrum. And the rest of us, you know, can sort of negotiate that middle part. But I do feel uh, that the arrogance with which uh, some scientists present themselves and the uh, idea that irrational, you know, to me, the wonderful thing about science, and then one of the reasons I got so fascinated by it was when I read about Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorem and, and Heisenberg's, it was like, oh my God, finally a universe that resembles something I know. So something confusing. Yeah, yeah, something absurd. I mean, to me, it was like going from a clockwork universe, which is boring to me, to a banana peel universe, which <laughs> you never know funnier, when you're going to sure. slip. Yeah. And that, to me, I would like to see science presenting itself, and I know it's very difficult to do when you're under attack, um, but presenting itself as what it really is, willing to change its mind. So, so I, I completely agree. I mean, that's why I think science... I, I have the, the, the view in my head that in, inevitably science it doesn't win or lose, but it, it increases in its value because it is the self-modifying base of knowledge. Exactly. And that is, that is, that's how I actually understand and what science And my concern and my passion also comes from the fact that I don't know how you have a secular democracy if you don't have science as a storyteller. Uh, so to me, if you're making science the villain. That wasn't very funny and it made me think really hard. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think oh, I agree. But you know why that's so good? Oh, here. Because I wrote down something someone said about you. Oh, God, no. No, no. no, this, no, is no. About the, this is about the world and the future, not no, about no, me. No, no, no. This is so good. It says, somebody said about you that, or maybe you said that so much of innovation comes from connecting across things where other people don't make connections. And it goes, uh, there are direct but invisible threads that run from the frivolous to the profound. So that's where comedy and science are completely alike. <laughs> I agree. This has actually been a great date. I've, I've, I had very few dates when I was young that were this challenging. Um. Well, I think, um, does that mean... I th we've got tw uh, 15 seconds, so oh, I, can, okay. I, can, I can tell a, f a filthy limerick. Oh, or do so. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's been an enormous pleasure. Absolutely.